Good morning, everyone. Um, so today, uh, my talk is about um, understanding spurious features. Uh, it's kind of built up on uh, top of uh, the talk that Rajesh gave. It's actually the project started in the last CGSI in collaboration with Rajesh Group. It's not here now, but um, so okay. So this project is about uh, understanding. Um, Spurious features from the point of view of a task difficulty. So for those of you who weren't in the first talk, I'm going to go do a little bit of recap. And this is relatively a short talk. So if you remember um, the discussion that we have with Rajesh about understanding of the shortcut, uh, so let me have a quick recap. So let's say that you train a neural network to distinguish, let's say, cows from like water birds. You, did a good, uh, you achieve a good classification accuracy, and your friend comes and gives you a new data set, and you see a significant drop in the performance of the data set that your friends give you. You inspect the data, you see that systematically in your training data, all of the cows in a green background, water bears on a water background, while a new data set, this systematic correlation between presence of the cow in the green background and water bird, or, uh, water bird is not there, which suggests that maybe your uh, classifier is focused in the background. So that basically suggests that, uh, so while in the training data there's a systematic connection between these short or spurious features, this connection is broken uh, in the test data. So there are ample opportunities of that in healthcare specifically, for example, medical imaging domain. This is, for example, the example that Rajesh gave that in a paper that was published by um, DeGrave et al., they showed that the neural network that's supposed to identify COVID from the images are basically sensitive on a cropping. So my theory of that, that why is it cropping? Because back then everybody wants to, do, to, do, uh, to help. They went back and extracted the images of this COVID patient from the literature, and these images are usually cropped. And as a result, uh, the, the neural network focused on a cropping area. This is why they're, they're focusing on the top and lower part of the image. It's not just that. For example, this another work by uh, Saab et al. They showed that uh, in a pneumothorax, the neural network may focus on presence of the tube. For example, in pneumothorax, it's very common practice that insert a tube to, pre uh, to preserve the pressure of the lung. Many of the patients before going to a scanner have this. So as a result, many of these methods that are trained on pneumothorax focus on a tube. So then for those patients that don't have a tube, the performance is, low, is lower. So, in fact, it can have, uh, be problematic uh, when we deploy our AI agent uh, in clinical setting. For example, you may remember a paper by Google a couple of years ago that were trying to identify cancer uh, from the images of the skin. And it turned out that their images are quite sensitive to the skin color. There has been a report recently in the literature that the race can be identified from X-ray images. However, it seems that the topic of spurious features is more nuanced than predicting sensitive variable from input image. For example, in this paper, uh, Ben Glocker et al. showed that in the case of X-ray images, there are changes in the prevalence of the disease between subgroup. So if you change this by resampling approach, the difference between performance of at least no finding disappears. While there is still some um, uh, discrepancies in a plural effusion. So I'm reading from the conclusion of the Ben Glocker et al. They said that we found that previously reported disparities for no finding disappears when correcting for statistical subgroup differences using resampling approach. However, our analysis confirmed that uh, disparate performance for detecting pleural effusion in black uh, patients still exists. We could not find a strong evidence that race information is directly or indirectly used by the disease detection model. So it seems that understanding what is spurious, when one feature is spurious, is beyond just 
predicting that the spurious features form the images. So let's we, so this talk is about understanding when this happened. So let me recap and uh, tell you what uh, how we can define this. Uh, what is our current understanding? How is the way that we define spurious features? So I'm going to explain this uh, in uh, using a toy example, and then I'm going to extend it to medical imaging data. So uh, let me explain this in a context that let's say you want to train a classifier, very simple case, to identify digit 7 from digit 8. So you have a label Y, and you have input image X. Of course, the label stipulates what should be an Im image. So there's Y, there's an arrow from Y to X. And in this case, most of the digit 7 have a patch on the top left. So spurious features here is represented by S, presence or absence of that influence image. And because most of the time, so or all of the time, or in the majority of the time, this patch happens with a specific label, there's an arrow from Y to S. I hope that this, un, uh, this explain why this uh, representation graphical model is represented. X is your input image, is influenced by your label and, and uh, your spurious feature S, and a spurious feature is correlated with Y. So from this graphical model, I can write the joint distribution of X, Y, and S as follows. Now imagine that I'm given a new test data set that this patch is no longer fully correlated with the digit seven. Sometimes it happens for digit eight, sometimes it doesn't appear. As a result, the link between the spurious features and the label is broken. And I can write the joint distribution as follows. And you see that factorization of the joint and uh, test and train distribution are different. Currently, the way that we define the spurious features as a change between distribution of the test and train. But it's not sufficient. Let me give you an example. Question is that, is it all about distribution shift? Is the spurious features is all about distribution shift? So, so now let me give you an example. So imagine that your test data is the same. You still want to distinguish seven and eight. And sometimes this white patch happens for eight, sometimes doesn't appear. There's no correlation between the label. But now you train two models. In model number one, the patch always happens with the digit seven. This is model number one. But you have another data set that in this data set, there is a, there is a spurious feature that all of the digit seven come with prime number on the top left, and all of digit eight comes with composite number. So in your opinion, which of these models is going to generalize better? How many people think that model one is more generalizable? And how many people think that model two is more generalizable? OK, how many people model 1? OK, how many people think that model M2 is more generalizable? OK, and then can somebody give me the, why do you think that model M2 is more generalizable, please? Figuring out what the prime number is. Not exactly. So it's like it's not, not only you have to identify what the digit is, you have to identify it with the prime number, too. So we expect that to be more generalizable. All right, so this talk is about do all the spurious features have generalization? Um, obviously, in that case, there's a still change in distribution of the train and test data. So why does the model, when and in what situation, model learn the spurious features? And, and can we identify it during the training phase? So the premise of these talks are as follows. First, spurious features hurt generalization if they are easier than the main task. The premise two is that initial layers of uh, initial layers in neural network learn, spur, uh, learn easier features, and it's earlier during the talk. So these are the three premises. And based on that, we are saying that the easy features learned by initial layers happen earlier on during the training phase. So because we are focusing on this notion of easy versus difficult, we need to be somehow able to identify what easy versus difficult are. We are adopting a notion called prediction depth. The work prediction depth uh, was uh, proposed 
back in 2021. I'm going to explain it uh, quickly. So the idea, the high-level idea of prediction depth is the earliest layer in a neural network that the model makes a decision after that it doesn't change its mind. It doesn't switch. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you train a neural network to distinguish cat and dog from each other. So here, cat are represented as a, as a blue, and the dog represented as red. And I can look into the scatter plot of the features during the neural network. So of course, like these features are my, much higher dimensional than two. So, but let me explain the concept using two-dimensional just for sake of simplicity. So if I look at the trend, if I look at the, my data set, um, I can create a scatter plot uh, of this cat and dog. And each of these layers have their own scatter plot, their own distribution. Now, for a new query data, the, the new query data falls somewhere in this distribution. So I can look at the k uh, neighbor of this uh, during the entire layers. For example, for this query, in the first one, in the first layer, is mostly in the vicinity of the red samples. It switches, and now it's close to vicinity uh, in, 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 this, uh, in the blue samples. Again, switch again. But then after layer four, it stays with the blue, and it doesn't change its mind. It doesn't change its uh, uh, label. So as a result, for this specific sample, the prediction depth is four, because that's the earliest layer. The model is always close to specific sample, and after that, doesn't change. So why is it useful? So then I can summarize, I can use this notion to summarize my data into some sort of histogram. So in this histogram, x axis is the layers, and the beans represent the samples that falls, that their prediction depth is that specific layer. Is the, is the notion of histogram clear? No. It's not, it's not clear? Sure. So, so so you can, you can basically associate the notion of prediction depth to each sample, right? One sample is prediction depth is two, another one five, another one seven. So I can create a histogram of these. So histogram says like how many of the samples are prediction depth five, how many of them two, how many of them 10. It summarized the entire data. Make sense? OK, cool. So why, what do we do with this histogram? So the prediction depth. Uh, the idea here is that the easier tasks are closer to the initial layers, and as the tasks become harder and harder, it shifts toward the end of the neural network. For example, in this case, predicting uh, the class uh, 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 clock in C410 is very easy. It happens usually earlier layer, and it goes further and further. The decision happens toward the end. And you can see that, for example, in fashion, MNIST, the histogram is closer toward left. And as we go toward, uh, let's say, CIFAR 100, which is a more complicated uh, data set, the distribution of this histogram shifts toward right. So you can use this as a notion of the difficulty of the data set. So why is it useful in, in the context of um, uh, spurious features? So now imagine that you have some idea about how difficult your task should be. For example, if I have this MNIST data set, I expect that like, it should be a very easy task. So if I create a histogram, this histogram should be very skewed toward left. And as my task become more and more difficult, the, the distribution of this histogram shifts more toward right, for example. Now, if you are given a new task, for example, now, you want to do the classification for, this is called Korean MNIST. You expect that to be a slightly more difficult than MNIST, but not as difficult, for example, as T410. So, so you expect that to be somehow between, you know, this fashion, what's called fashion MNIST and like C410. Uh, but you start training a data, and you see that everything is skewed so much toward left. You can go and look into the samples that are falling to the first pin, and you can identify it using some of these post hoc explanation approach and see that there is a patch. So you can use this method as a debugging approach. If you have some ideas how, your how difficult your task should be. If it is too skewed from what it's supposed to be, 
you can go and identify those samples which are in, in that bins and visualize them to, to, to debug your model. To go back to the, the example that I started earlier, for example, on that data set, if you train your model and you create your prediction depth histogram, you can see that there is a big jump at the initial layers. And if you go back and visualize it, you see that they are focusing on the background. Now, let's see some examples on um, NIH data set for, uh, for uh, pneumothorax and a few other conditions. You see that although most of the, uh, the samples are falling toward right, there is two peaks at the beginning and in the middle layer. In fact, if you go back and visualize those layer, we see that they are uh, on the layer four, they are focusing on the presence of this tube. And, if you, uh, and in fact, this is corroborated by disparities between performance of this method in terms of uh, area under curve. For the patient with the tube, the, uh, the performance of the model is much higher than for the patient without the tube. That suggests that the model is focusing on that. If you focus on the other uh, peak on the histogram, you see that there is a marker of the, uh, of the hospital that is picked up by the model. And in fact, this is somehow e uh, easy to identify during the training dynamic of the model. So let me explain what this plot is about. On, um, on the left-hand side, right-hand side, OK. So you see that uh, the evolution of the area under curve as with epochs. And we have identified a couple of points to show the histogram of the prediction depth. So these plots, these eight plots that you see on the other side, they're all um, prediction depth. But if you notice, there's a red bar next to it. So let me explain what these red bars are. From the top, these are the first epoch, fourth epoch, seventh epoch, so on and so forth. And the red are the proportion of the samples that are undecided, meaning that the prediction depth is very, very end. And as you see that as we move forward, by the way, this is like the, the red is like very large. So but like you wanted to put it in the same figure, so you just like kind of scale it. But it's very large. At the early on, so many of samples are undecided because the model has not converged. As we go forward, the, the height of these red samples, samples that are undecided, reduce and reduce, and the samples are associated with different beams. And you see that most of them goes to these beams that are like supposed to be difficult beams. But another interesting thing is that these two bars are pretty, honest, pretty stable, meaning that the fate of some of the samples in terms of classification are decided early on, and it does not change during a dynamic. So this basically uh, provides evidence for the second aspect of the hypothesis that we have is that the spurious features, the, the model latch on the spurious features in earlier layers and in earlier during the dynamic, which suggests that we should be able to, we might be able to find a way to intervene and take these samples out of the, um, this local minimum. Sure. Well, I wonder how you decide to um, determine say, what these pluses are. How do you det determine what? Uh, the, the, the red bar, like how do you quantify it? Yeah, that's very, that's a difficult thing that you, you won't, uh, currently I don't have a specific way to do that. Um, so it's, right now we view it as an extra tool along with is like an extra debugging tool. But I don't have like a, some sort of like a null distribution. So the, the general estimate of the, of the depth, uh, you look at, how do, how do you define it based on? This is currently mean. This is, this, is, this is currently the, the red is like average. Average distribution of the prediction depth. Does that make sense? Well, the carrier nearest neighbor of the uh, intermediate layers. And whether it, they change at all, or like a fraction of these change, or what is the... Uh, what change? Hmm? What change? I mean, you know, like, you look for each sample, like whether the carrier's neighbor stay the same, or whether they change. 
So, so the way that it works is that you have your right, so you're not using the training data, you have an audit set of data to create this. So you for each of these intermediate layer, use that data set and then you have a, so you use each of those for example for query. You see that you, for evaluation data you still have your uh, labels, right? You see that for each samples, if you use k-nearest neighbor, what would be the label of that uh, uh, sample? Exactly, exactly. And the embedding space of intermediate layers. Now, is any, any other question? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, so that you say that the initial layer predicted value remains constant in all this training, right? So I was wondering, uh, we know that the initial layers of deep networks are usually capture low frequency features. So do you think the squeeze features could be the low frequency features? Um, I'm not really sure it's always like low frequency features. It depends on the filter. So is, is, is okay. So for example, we know that, so for example, for, for things like tube, it's not necessarily low frequency. But it's easy to identify because you only need to do edge detection. So edge is not low frequency. There's no shape. Yeah, yeah. So because for shape, you need multiple layers and combine the information. Yeah. Yes. So it's hard to say that easy features are necessarily low frequency. It's not necessarily similar. Any other question? OK. So now the next question is that, is, um, is the prediction depth some ad hoc? metric or is there is something deeper into this. So let me uh, introduce another notion of uh, task, default, uh, task difficulty. There is a notion of task difficulty called uh, fee usable information that's proposed by Zhu et al. and then like later on uh, it was used by uh, another uh, other Covin et al. Uh, back in ICML 2022. That basically idea is that the difficulty of the task is not just about distribution, but it's about the inductive bias that the model can extract from your data. So let me give you an example. Um, so consider that you want to distinguish cat and dog from each other. We know that our neural network are really can identify with very high accuracy. So should not be very difficult tasks. They're separable from each other in some space. But if I, let's say, they encrypt the images with some encryption key and give it to you, then it's a very difficult task. Because first, your model should be able to decrypt the data and then use it. So if the encrypted version of the data is not very usable for your neural network. So basically, this notion of uh, reusable information means that, so basically you are saying that like if all of this space, the space, of, the space of the function that you can use is like infinite, like this can be anything, it's just Shannon entropy. But the, your network limits the space of information that you can actually use. So we showed uh, in our project in collaboration with Rajesh that prediction depth and V information essentially gives the same level of information. If a task is difficult in the point of view of prediction depth, it's also difficult in, ter in terms of V information. Now let me go back to the examples that I um, uh, mentioned in the middle of the talk. So if you go into the task difficulty and try to use X-ray images uh, uh, to predict each of these uh, variables, the first one is, let's say, view. What do I mean by view? The view means that is, is your image is acquired coronally or is acquired sagittally. This is very easy task. You just take a look at the image and it's the easiest task possible. And you see that the prediction depth is skewed very much toward uh, left. 
The next task, in, uh, in the next one in terms of uh, level of difficulty is biological sex. The biological is, sex is relatively easy to identify because the breast line is usually obvious from the uh, Im images, but it's definitely harder than view. Age is more difficult because it's, at the end of the day, the model more or less has to estimate the bone density and then from that correlated with age. Overall, it's much harder. Self-playing brace is much, much harder task than any of those. And this is why in that paper by Ben Glocker et al, they suggested that although it can be predicted, it may not bias because it may not bias your model because your task might be much easier. To conclude, we talked about the spurious features uh, not being all about distribution. It's about the relative difficulty of the task and the spurious features in which the architecture of your network is very important. And in order to identify it, you have to use them, you have to look into the entire pipeline. For example, in the initial example that I gave earlier about the, uh, you know, skin cancer, skin cancer, the, the color of the skin is very easy to identify. But in, now imagine that you have, you change your pre-processing pipeline that you only focus on edge images. If edge extraction is part of your image, then the, your pipeline may remove this information. And now the usable information for your network for a spurious task may not be there. So you have to use into entire pipeline and to see whether uh, the, the prediction of sensitive variables is easy or not. The, the method that we suggested, uh, we are suggesting basically to go beyond just tra test, train, and validation loss, which is common practice in machine learning to debug our model. The best practice that is suggested in data science is that visualize as much as possible, and we just showed one. Um, prediction depth is just one example of those many, many things that you are better off to predict to, to debug your model. And we also just suggested at the end that uh, lack of generalizability of these approaches is more nuanced than predicting sensitive variable using input data. And this is the reference. Thank you.